Hello, everybody. Welcome to the University of Florida Law School eDiscovery Story Booth, back by popular demand, uh, both the conference and the story booth, uh, which we had a, a whole lot of fun doing uh, several years ago when we were when, <laughs> way back in the midst of time when we were doing conferences live and in person and could actually talk to human beings face to face. Uh, and and I, I was uh, delighted to be asked to do it again. Our first guest here today is uh, known to many, if not most of you, unless you've been uh, living under an e-discovery rock for the last uh, five years. It's uh, Kelly Twigger, noted lawyer and technologist and mom, and um, also a uh, member of the planning committee uh, for the conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Kelly, you have a, a great company called e-discovery assistant, right. which uh, provides case law um, for people to review. I use it myself. I, I was just talking a moment ago. We we were looking for some cases about sampling in mm -hmm. um, in uh, uh, e-discovery matters, ESI matters. There was a case out of Seattle where uh, the judge ordered um, a sample of a million documents. Ooh. So and that generated a little sample. excitement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, tell us what's what's going on with the e-discovery assistant. What's the, what's the latest and greatest? Yeah. So if you haven't heard of e-discovery assistant before, essentially I built it back in 2012 um, <clears throat> because there was so much case law happening so quickly and so many rule changes happening so quickly that you know the way our practice works at ESI attorneys is we get a call from a client and says we have a new case in the middle district of Tennessee or we have a new case in the northern district of California and it's between the it's under this judge and here's the case and you know, we got to get started on how we're going to handle discovery. And um, and so the I wanted to be able to look up cases by the judge and by the issues and know right away, um, you know, what's happening. And so that's really the premise on which eDiscovery Assistant was built. We built it originally just as an internal tool. And then uh, people started using it and asking us for a lot of stuff. So we built it um, as an external. And it's gone through a lot of iterations. It's now a SaaS-based platform um, that's on a subscription basis. And, um, you know, we have a, a lot of firms, a lot of in-house counsel, government agencies, a lot of folks who are using it. Um, I think the thing that makes it unique is there's a proprietary issue tagging structure that's assigned to all the cases. So when you go in and you're looking for sampling cases, all you had to do is click sampling uh, as an issue and then click the jurisdiction you were looking for and boom, those cases should come right up. So I think the, the main feature of eDiscovery Assistant is that it saves you a lot of time trying to get to what you're looking for in the eDiscovery universe. Um, the biggest difficulty in searching for case law that I found, and the reason why we built the tagging structure, is that judges use different language to describe different processes. Like the judges in your case may not have even used the word sampling. Um, you know, when you talk about proportionality, a lot of judges weigh the Rule 26 factors, but they don't use the word proportionality. So our team manually reviews all that case law and then assigns issue tags to it. So it really helps yeah. narrow your, your search and your focus a lot faster. Um, the, sort of the, like Pandora. Right, so exactly. Like, it is a bit like, it is a bit like that. Yep. Yeah, and you can yeah. see, you can see within there, you can see related cases from across the country that have the same issue tagging structure. Right. Um, you can also see additional decisions on the same case. Uh, so we've got. I mean, we have cases that will have 12, 13 different discovery orders that were issued. Um, and then we try to try to do some education based off of e-discovery assistance. So we work with ACEDS, who I believe is another partner for the UF conference. Um, and we work with them each week to, to create the case of the week where we take a, take a case that my team helps me identify and talk about the practical applications of it. You know, next week we're going to talk about attorney-client privilege and some unique uh, data points that we haven't that I haven't really seen before in terms of a law firm using uh, to store client information and whether that's going to be uh, privileged. And so, you know, there's just so much happening in e-discovery in case law all the time, and there's new technologies that are coming up all the time that we have to pay attention to and understand how they impl Im impact us when we're trying to look for collect produce that kind of information. So, right. yeah. Now, so to that platform, point, yeah. I understand, I'm sorry to interrupt, but okay. let, let, let segue, if you will, into you're doing a session at the conference on that very topic, right? Yeah. On case law. And yeah. I presume you're going to talk about some of these things. You're, you're speaking with uh, uh, the Honorable 
Mac McCoy. Mm-hmm. Mac, well, I, I said, I've got Mac written here and I'm thinking, that doesn't sound right. That's, That's right. Is his name Mac? Yep. Mac McCoy. Mac McCoy. Yeah. Terrific judge and, in uh, mm-hmm. and Maria Salacusi. There's yep. a, there's a name I can butcher really well. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, Mary- tell us about that. I mean, how's that, how's that all going to work? What you just talked about going into that session. Yeah, so um, I'm really excited about our session, actually. Judge McCoy is just fantastic. You know, he's been on the bench, I think, for about eight years, and he uh, just has some really unique insights, but he also practiced a lot of e-discovery before he joined the bench. So where does he sit? uh, He is in Florida. I believe he's in the middle district of Florida, but now you got me because I could get that. That's all right. It's all it's all um, one big swamp to me. <laughs> um, no, they're just sort of made the Southern District. Um, but uh, but he's down in Florida. And uh, this is the second or third year, I think, Judge McCoy is joining us for the conference. Uh, oh, okay. He's just, just a great guy who's got a lot of really terrific insights. He approaches everything from a really practical perspective. Um, and I'm looking forward to his thoughts on the various topics. Uh, Maria is in charge of um, technology and support and e-discovery at the EOC. Uh, ah. So she heads up a, a group of about 200 lawyers um, and is constantly trying to keep them up to date on what's happening with electronic discovery. So um, she's very familiar with the case law um, and the EEOC. If you do a search for EEOC and e-discovery assistant, you'll find a lot of cases involving the EEOC. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was involved with a case here in New Orleans a number of years ago, several years ago. And- the EEOC was one of the plaintiffs, right. the famous, uh, the famous uh, shipbuilders case where they were keeping the, yep. the workers behind a, a barbed wire fence and had taken their uh, passports away from them when they brought them in. Um, yeah, the, the EEOC gets a lot of interesting issues. And yes. as a government agency on the plaintiff side, they also raise a lot of really interesting issues that a lot of plaintiffs don't get to raise. And so, right. you know, um, we work on both sides of the V at, at ESI attorneys. And so sure. uh, we know what the plaintiff's difficulties are in being able to try and negotiate, you know, with defendants, particularly when it's asynchronous, right? And the defendant has most all of the data. That's a real problem. But you've got to know when to assert yourself. You know, one of the things we've been talking about recently is that it's a lot easier to get sanctions under Rule 37B when you've got a motion or an order that's violated, a court order that's violated, than it is under 37E when you're just talking about failure to preserve. Yeah. So, um, you know, lots of nuances. So anyway, our approach to the case law panel this year is slightly different. Um, yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. Instead of just t- talking about individual, about saying, picking 10 cases and talking about them, I wanted yeah. to put it in a practical context. So you know me, I always have to have a point about everything. So um, so we've chosen a number of, of different issues and we're selecting cases that really highlight the practical issues in those cases and give you real takeaways from case law as to how you should be approaching things. So ah, good. Search, good. search terms and transparency and what the process should be for search terms is one of the things we'll cover. Um, talking about the ESI protocol and the, the need to have something that's very tailored to your case without having it doesn't need to be expansive it doesn't need to be huge um and uh talking about teams and google and how data can be captured and and dealt with there you know hyperlinks the noom case that we've talked about ad nauseum over the last year and how the court dealt with hyperlinks in that case and decided they weren't attachments that has some rather dramatic implications for how we deal with data going forward so, you know, self-collection, we may touch on TAR a little bit. We're still kind of identifying all the practical things we want to talk about. But the goal is to say, here's the case law on these practical issues. And you need to okay. be paying attention to these individual things. And then um, one of the features that we're building in eDiscovery Assistant, which will be great for this, is uh, the ability for you to set up your own alerts. So if you want to say, I want to see every sampling case that comes out, you know, or I want to see all the new cases on TAR. Um, then you'll be able to get an alert every time a case comes out with that tag that's added, you know, and you'll be nice. able to add over the filters. So, so yeah, so I think I'm hopeful that the case law session is going to be really practical. It's going to be a, you know, an opportunity yeah. for folks who don't get to immerse themselves in the e-discovery case law to, to take away some practical things that they can use. Yeah, that's kind of the focus. We, as you know, uh, uh, um, one quarter of a panel that uh, Doug Austin does every month. Um, that has Mary Mack and, and Judge Peck, and we use eDiscovery Assistant to pull down cases and 
Usually Great. we highlight between seven to nine or 10 cases every month, but the, that's really, yeah, the, the focus we've, we've really leaned on is what's the practical implications of right. this? What, what does this mean to you? It's not, you know, this isn't a bar review course, <laughs> you know, you're not doing this just for the, the glory of the, of the knowledge, you know, how's it gonna help you? How's it gonna make your case better, uh, easier to win? How's it gonna make you a better lawyer? So um, that's yeah, great. Uh, like one that. of the things I love about the the presentations that you guys do is you always include the links to the cases. And yes. uh, one of the things we built in eDiscovery Assistant that makes it different than other platforms is uh, it drives me crazy when I can't read the actual case that someone's talking about. So we built what we call public links to the case. So if you have a link to that case, even if you're not a subscriber to eDiscovery Assistant, you can still go on and view the full text of that case and search within yeah. it. You can't use the other features of the platform, but um, because I want people to be reading stuff. I mean, people ask me a lot about, well, why you have eDiscovery Assistant when you have law firm and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, the answer is twofold. One is I need it. We need it for our law firm. Um, and two, I really want people to use the power of ESI. I mean, I think this year's theme is around the joy of eDiscovery and, and, in reality, there are tons of benefits to dealing yeah. with ESI. Talk about that. You know, yeah. we, we talked about the theme earlier and uh, offline and uh, uh, you immediately said, let's talk about the benefits. So yeah, go into that a little bit. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I've had cases before where, I, you know, even in the last couple of years during the pandemic, where just knowing, you know, my knowledge of how information stored um, and what kinds of information is available to be able to back up someone's story were really the dispositive factors in the case. I mean, we, we said, OK, well, the audit logs, if you think that they went and stole all this information, the audit logs will tell us. So give us the audit logs for these five applications. And boom, the case settled because they looked at the audit logs, which they hadn't looked at before they filed the complaint. And they found that, you know, they didn't support what they were trying to, the story they were trying to pin on our clients. So ESI can be used very effectively to one, give you a picture, an overall picture of what your case looks like um, for you to, to really start early on to see what it is that you have or, or where you need to be. It can also really help you, uh, understand where you need to take action in terms of discussing with your people, how they communicate. Um, you know, now that we have text messages and social media and instant messaging, all different kinds of applications, people speak off the cuff even more than they do in email. And so, you know, there's opportunities to look at that data and then be able to make adjustments within your organization um, to sort of save face and save money going forward. Um, right. So, you know, I, I feel like there are a lot of benefits to ESI. It's here to stay, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but when you just look at it as the negatives of the volume and the costs associated with it, um, if you're doing it effectively, you can make it less expensive than traditional discovery has been when we looked at the same piece of paper five and six times. Right, right. Well, I, I appreciate all your observations. Any last words of wisdom before we wrap up? Uh, tell, no, I, you know what? Tell me again, uh, just to remind people, the dates of the conference? Oh, that's a good question. You killed me there. I think it's the 23rd and 24th of March. There we go. So the Wednesday and Thursday, we're doing it over two days this year. Um, we have that's, that's where I was going is it's yeah. traditionally been a one day and now it's expanded. So we clearly have a lot more to, to, to talk about and uh, enlighten we do. people. We do. And um, we've got a great fireside chat um, set up with Amy Sellers, who is just one of the you know premier people in the space. And, um, you know, as always, we'll have our judicial panel. Um, I think it's a, the thing that's great about UF is that it's always a very practical conference and there's yes. a lot of discussion and dialogue. Um, and of course, this pandemic is making it a little bit more difficult to engage in those things in the ways that we have in person. But, um, you know, we all come from different, all of the speakers come from all over, you know, their plaintiffs, defense, government, you know, corporation, law firm, small firm, large firm, you know, and so there's a lot of different perspectives and a lot of knowledge to tap into. And I think, you know, we are, who participate on the planning committee um, do so because we really want to bring this, a good level of education to folks. And I think last year we had almost 10,000 people who, uh, wow. 
participated um, virtually. So if you wow. uh, have not yet signed up for the conference and you're watching this lovely video, please do use the registration link that I'm sure will be attached uh, to the video and uh, get signed up. It is free. It is virtual. Um, you can join in person, but I think we have a limited number in person. So I maybe I should take that back. But um, it's completely free. So you can sign on, you can log in, you can have as many people from your organization participate as you want. And uh, we'd encourage you all to join us because it will be it'll be good. Good deal. Well, again, Kelly, thanks for your observations. Hey, how's the weather out there in fabulous Colorado? Oh, it's beautiful today. It's uh, bright blue skies. We still got some snow on the ground, but it's about 40. So yeah. very you know, simple compared to some of the other areas of the country. Yeah, the the even our part of the east, the southeast, has just been uh, 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 we're like an ice cube tray uh, for the last uh, four or five days. We hope to be coming out of it. But of course, for us, that means it's like 50, I was going to say, you know? isn't that forty? Is that forty an ice cube <laughs> oh, tray? Oh no, forty! <laughs> Don't even say those words. Forty. That's <laughs> See, my kids go to school in shorts at forty. <laughs> yeah, I actually walked out the door a couple of days ago to go down to the store. And I was wearing blue jeans and one of my neighbors yelled out of her window, hey, wait a minute, I've never seen you with long pants on. What's going on? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I said, oh, they said it's going to be 41 later. I want to make sure I stay. With <laughs> <laughs> That's classic. So, yeah, all I think right, it's all well, what you're used to, right? I'm looking yeah. forward to coming to see you guys in uh, in New Orleans, though, soon. You know, we keep talking about Jazz Fest. And Jazz Fest is a go as far as the city is planning. You know, we have this little party called Mardi Gras in between yes. then and now. Um, but uh, we're really more excited about Jazz Fest. I'd love to have you if you come down. We'll be Absolutely. we'll be boiling some crawfish out front and, and sitting around talking and telling lies and just generally having a good time. Fantastic. I look forward to it. I look All forward. right. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thank you, everybody. Bye.